to uh, have with us today Ariel Ordar. He is with us as a guest of uh, Linz. So you will have the opportunity to meet and discuss with him in November. Then he will break a little bit, you know, too much Parisian as uh, needs a break. So, and he will be back in January. We can start discussing with, with him, then match you a little bit the points, and then come back in, in January. So I'm not going to spend too much time to introduce Ariel. I mean, he's around since uh, a while, as, as us. <laughs> as uh, some of us. Some of us, yeah. Uh, that's unfortunate, but that's life. And he has been doing a lot of work, really uh, very inspiring work on routine quality of service, game theory, and others. And uh, I'm not going to name all the awards that he has received for education and research. He had a break as a dean of uh, Technion Computer Science Department. Electrical Engineering Department. Electrical Engineering, sorry. Yeah. But it's confusing. <laughs> So he has been you know, serving the community for a while, which is also very important. And now he's uh, back with us for those two months. And again, it's really a, a, an a amazing opportunity for you to exchange with him about his uh, research interest, about Technion as well, and all the work that have been uh, developing there. So today, he had the possibility to give different type of talks. I advise him to give this one. It's a quite broad uh, uh, technical uh, presentation, so it will give you maybe more opportunities as this is really addressing the whole uh, Lynx community to see where you could eventually uh, touch base with him on those different uh, points. Ariel, it's a pleasure. Actually, the, thank you, Serge, and actually the pleasure is uh, all mine. I, I know that it is a custom that the guest would say um, that he's really pleased to be here, but believe me, truly, honestly, I'm very pleased to be here in Paris and here uh, with you today. So uh, what I may shall do today is a bit challenging, two for the price of one. I shall overview two pieces of work. Uh, both dealing with the application of game theory to communication networks, uh, but uh, from different angles. And the first piece uh, formed part of the PhD thesis of Eli Meron, done under the so uh, joint supervision of Shaiman Or and myself. And in the, uh, this study, we attempted to uh, model the evolution of the internet inter-AS topology through a game theoretic framework. As I guess that everybody here knows, at its highest level, the internet is composed by autonomous systems, and, uh, uh, and these uh, autonomous systems need to interconnect among themselves in order to establish the global uh, internet. And we propose to model uh, the evolution of the topology that represents the interconnection among uh, autonomous systems through a network formation game. Now, essentially, what is a, a network formation game? It is a game in which each node, or in our case, each autonomous system, is a player, is a rational, self-optimizing uh, uh, agent. And each node needs to decide with which other nodes it wants to connect directly, that is, establish links or a, a neighborhood, a na neighborship uh, relationships. And in doing that, it needs to contemplate a trade-off between two things. On the one hand, there is a cost incurred for establishing and maintaining such a connection. On the other hand, of course, a node wants to somehow get connected to all the other nodes, uh, either directly or through some paths. And furthermore, each node would like to be connected through routes, through paths that are short enough. So thus far, this is a classic setting of a network formation game. However, we decided that in order to properly model the evolution of the internet interest topology, we need to uh, add some more ingredients. First, we decided that we need to deal with heterogeneous players. Autonomous systems, ISPs, come in various uh, sizes and types. Uh, there are major ones, minor ones, and we decided that these should be reflected in our model. Furthermore, the internet, being an engineered structure, is prone to failures, and maybe it's important to maintain connectivity even under the presence of a failure. So it might not be good enough to be connected uh, uh, to all the destinations, 
even uh, uh, through a short enough paths, maybe you, you need to account also for possible failures on the primary paths. As is uh, done in uh, virtually all studies that apply game theory to communication networks, we started with a static analysis that is considered the uh, uh, equilibrium solutions of the underlying game and try to characterize its properties. However, and as opposed to most studies that have applied game theory to networks, we decided that in our case it's important to conduct also a dynamic analysis. That is, to understand what happens along the trajectory uh, to equilibrium. And this is because the internet topology has not converged and maybe it never will. Things keep happening, autonomous systems show up or disappear, etc. So maybe it's even more important to understand what happens along the way that, rather than just at the end of the way. And, and here again, as opposed to most studies that have applied game theory to networking, we conducted here a data analysis. That is, we examined real data about the past evolution of the internet interest topology. And we uh, tried to see to what extent the predictions of our model and analysis are or are not confirmed in the real data. Okay, so to recap, heterogeneity. As a first cut, we decided to deal with two types of players, namely major players, the set A, and minor players, the set B. The first will be denoted by blue squares in our illustrations, the second by uh, red uh, circles. Each such player needs to contemplate, as I said, a trade-off between two things. The first is the cost for establishing and maintaining links, and there is one place where heterogeneity comes in, we said that essentially this cost depends on one thing, namely on your type. If you are a type A player, a major player, it costs you CA euros or whatever to maintain each link. If you are a minor player, CB uh, uh, units. And uh, essentially we said that a major uh, AS, a major ISP, usually has a bigger budget, so the prices contemplated by it would uh, 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 appear to it to be smaller. So in this uh, figure here, we have a, sec a, a minor player I, and it has, it has decided to establish two links, so, so for that it would pay two, its degree, times CB, be uh, uh, because he's a type B player. The second component is your aggregate distance. Once the topology is established, you have to look for the shortest path between you, in terms of the number of hops, the shortest path between you and every destination, and you sum up all these uh, distances of the shortest paths. That the that's the second component of your cost. However, here too, heterogeneity comes in. Usually it's more important to be close to a major player rather than to a minor player. So what we said is that we shall uh, 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 multiply the aggregate distance from from you, from the player, towards all the major players by some factor A, A is bigger than one. So this is the cost of the distance from the major players, and this is the cost from the minor, as from the minor players. We also contemplated the possibility of monetary transfers, that is, having one node pay another node in order to persuade it to do some things. And as we shall see, this possibility may play a critical role in our story. And as I said, there is the reliability requirement. You should consider the possibility of a failure, and maybe you need to keep continue, uh, to, uh, to keep uh, continuous connectivity even in spite of a, flares, uh, of a failure. So to, this, to do that, you need at least two node disjoint paths from you to, uh, uh, to every destination. But here too, heterogeneity comes in. Maybe this rigid requirement should be in effect also, uh, sorry, sorry, only with respect to the major destinations. Maybe to get uh, disconnected from a minor destination is not that terrible. So we contemplated both cases, the case in which you have to maintain connectivity under a, a failover uh, with respect to all destinations or only with respect to the major uh, destinations. A second issue that uh, comes in when we start contemplating about reliability and failures, etc., is, okay, now we have two paths per destination. 
to no decision paths. But when we talk about the distance between me and the destination, what is this distance now? Till now, we, I said that it shall be the distance of the shorter, shortest path. But now I have two paths. So the answer to that has to do with how frequent we deem failures to occur. occur. If failures uh, are, expect, uh, are expected to be uh, quite uh, infrequent, then maybe I should insist on counting just the distance of the shorter path. The backup path will not be employed so uh, uh, frequently, so I, I don't care about its length. However, if, uh, uh, if the failures are frequent, then I should uh, consider equal, maybe even equally the length of the two paths. So to account for that, we added another parameter to our story parameter delta that runs from zero to one. Zero means that you don't care about the distance of the, sec the backup path. Delta equal to one means that it, uh, it is equally important and delta can take all the values in the range. So to uh, illustrate all that I've been saying, suppose that I'm now accounting from my distance, I'm, I'm a player number i, node number i, from all the major destinations. So first of all, as, I, as we said, I shall multiply everything by this factor a bigger than one because I care more about my distance from these destinations. And then I add up some combination of the distances of the, uh, short, uh, of the primary path uh, usually the shorter one and the backup path. However, the distance of the backup path is multiplied by this delta and I average everything over one plus delta. So for example, here in this uh, case, we have just five primary nodes and there are precisely two paths from me to each other node, the shorter one and the longer one. If I care just about the shorter path, that is, if delta is equal to zero, then the aggregate distance is six times a, one plus one plus two plus two times a. And if, I, if delta is equal to one, then this summation uh, uh, gives us 12 and a half a. Okay. As I said, our first stage was a static analysis, that is, to consider what happens at the equilibrium. But what is an equilibrium here? Let us consider a pair of nodes i and j. A link will be established between i and j if, and only if, both i and j conclude each that it is beneficial for it to do so. That is, the price that it has to pay for establishing the link is balanced and beyond that by the decrease in its aggregate distance from all the other nodes by virtue of this new link. Likewise, an existing link between i and j shall be deleted if either i or j realizes that it would benefit by deleting the link. So a link exists if and only if both endpoints agree on that. Accordingly, a pairwise equilibrium, which is our equilibrium concept, is a topology in which no link can be established or deleted according to these two rules. Okay, to sum up. So we uh, uh, com constructed a model that incorporates heterogeneity, reliability, possible monetary transfers, and on that we, we conducted static analysis, dynamic analysis, and compared everything with real data. And I shall now give you a very brief snapshot of some of the results in each of these uh, three fronts. Starting with uh, the static analysis. Here we realized that we would like to introduce a new price concept. Those of you that are acquainted with the application of game theory to networks or to computer systems in general are acquainted with the concept of the price of anarchy, which I shall uh, refer to it also later. Essentially, the price of anarchy tells us how much the system pays in terms of overall performance due to the fact that in order to optimize it, the players play a selfish game. And it is defined as the social performance at the Nash equilibrium, at the equilibrium of the game over the uh, optimal system performance. So by definition, the price of anarchy cannot be less than one. You cannot do better than the social optimum, okay? Likewise, we uh, 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 introduced this concept of price of reliability that considers the following. Let us consider two games, which are the same except for one thing. In one game, you do not have the reliability requirement. You don't need 
uh, disjoint paths. It's enough to have, uh, have a single path to every destination. In the other one, you do have the reliability requirement. Each of the two would give rise to a, a usually different equilibrium. So let us measure the social performance in each of the two equili uh, equilibria. And the price of reliability is the social cost of the game with reliability over the social cost in the game without the reliability. Okay? However, as opposed to the price of anarchy, the price of reliability in principle can be less than one because maybe we do something good to the system performance by demanding reliability. What is social performance? Well, uh, we adopted the very common uh, 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 idea that the social performance is accounted by, by the aggregate cost paid by all the users. The cost that they pay for all the links and the cost that they, uh, 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 that is rep that they uh, uh, experience in terms of the aggregate distances. The summation of all the, uh, of all the players is the social cost. So to illustrate this concept, suppose that in our story we have just uh, these three nodes. If we impose the reliability requirement, there is just one possible solution, one possible equilibrium, which is this tri triangle. That's the only way to get two disjoint paths between every pair of nodes. If we do not impose the reliability requirement, then maybe by setting the cost parameters in the right way, the resulting equilibrium will be just this pair of links. Why shouldn't these, these, these two nodes interconnect? Well, maybe when they consider the price incurred for establishing the link, they, they realize that it's uh, more costly than what they would achieve by decreasing their distance from two to one. Okay, which is better in terms of social performance? This case, this topology, or this one? It depends on how we set the parameters, okay? It depends on uh, how the cost of establishing the links uh, compares with the uh, cost uh, implied by the aggregate distances. However, now getting to the real thing, to our uh, setting, it turned out that for a wide range of cost parameters, the social optimum is achieved in a de very dense or by a very dense topology, namely a topology in which all the major nodes establish a click among themselves, each pair of them connects, and each of the minor nodes attaches itself to each of the major nodes. A dense, very dense topology. But we are now in a game. Let's start with a game without the reliability requirement. It turns out that for that wide range of para cost parameters, the equilibrium is achieved by having all the primary nodes establish a click. That's good news. They do in the equilibrium precisely what the network or the social optimum wants. However, the bad news are that in the equilibrium, each of the secondary nodes attaches itself to just one primary node. Not to every primary node, but just to one. Very far from the social optimum. That's without the reliability requirement. With the reliability requirement, attaching yourself to just one node is not good enough. You, you, you will not have two disjoint paths in such a way. And it turns out that the equilibrium of the same game, but with the reliability requirement, is such that each secondary node attaches itself to the click by attaching itself to precisely two primary nodes. So by imposing the reliability requirement, we force these guys to make one step closer to the social optimum, meaning that the price of anarchy for, uh, sorry, the price of reliability for that wide range of parameters is less than one. You might say, well, maybe this should be always the case because you see, these guys behave in a cheap way. Each greedily considers the costs of establishing a link and it usually decides not to establish too many links while the social optimum wants a much denser topology. Well, not always. Consider, sometimes reliability can buy, the reliability considerations can backfire us. Consider, for example, this a, a example in which we have just primary nodes and suppose that have, they have reached this topology. They are just one step before getting to the social optimum. All that they need to do is to have these two guys interconnect to get the click which is the social optimum. Without the reliability requirement, Suppose that we set the parameters in such a way that these two guys say, 
each of them says, well, yes, it pays. The cost for establishing it is more than balanced by having the distance between the two of us decrease from two to one. So let's do that. Okay, good. So in this case, the, the, the equilibrium coincides with the uh, social optimum. But now let's plug in the reliability requirement. Well, in terms of reliability, in this topology, everybody is doing fine. Even without this link, we already have two paths between the two of us. So when we consider whether one and two, so when we consider whether to establish this link, the only consideration is whether, again, whether the cost of establishing it is balanced by having the cost between us decrease. But decrease from what? Recall that when we have the reliability requirement, we have to introduce that parameter delta that says how frequent faults are likely to occur. And suppose that faults are likely to occur. Delta is one. So the aggregate distance between us is, does not decrease from two to one, but it decreases from two to the average between the primary, which is one, and the distance of the secondary, which is two. So it's one and a half. And maybe decreasing the cost in terms of the distance by just half a unit is not good enough to compensate for the cost of establishing the link, in which case these guys will not establish the link. Meaning that due to the reliability requirement, we got far away from a, a, the network optimum. Hence, in this case, the price of the reliability would be more than one. So the price of reliability can be anything between zero and infinity. OK. Another issue, symmetry or lack thereof. As I said, we need two disjoint paths, but sometimes we may want to impose that a, a, a constraint or requirement only with respect to major destinations. Now, suppose that we have this topology, one major node and several a, a secondary nodes, and suppose that at some stage they have established a line topology. With the reliability requirement, with a symmetrical reliability requirement, that is, you need two paths with respect to everybody, some links like this will need to be established because on the line topology, you have just a single path, okay? However, if, you, you, if we do not have a symmetrical requirement, it, it, this means that the prim this primary node would say, well, I, I don't need anything else. I don't need secondary paths. I don't need backup paths. It's you guys that need that, but I don't care about that. And for me, maybe the price of establishing this is not compensated by the decrease in distance, so I'm, I'm against that. And recall, without the uh, 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 agreement of both sides, a link is not established. So this is a mess because this guy badly needs such a link, and this guy is not willing to cooperate with that. Due to this uh, anomaly, we got the following finding. We investigated the price of anarchy. Again, the ratio between the co social cost of the, uh, uh, the equilibrium over the optimal value of the social cost. And it turned out that with symmetrical requirement, that is when we don't, need the, uh, we, when we don't have the problem because everybody needs a disjoint path, we have been able to show that the price of anarchy is pretty small. Small in what sense? In the sense that it depends on something that is independent in the network size. That's I, that something is C, which is the average cost for establishing a link, that is CA plus CB over two. The important thing is that it does not depend on the network size. Uh, that is, it doesn't matter how many nodes you have in your network. However, without the asymmetrical requirement, due to problems like this, the price of anarchy is, can be essentially unbounded because maybe there's no stable solution to this problem. However, how, ca how can you uh, uh, solve such a sit situation? One way to do that is by introducing the possibility of monetary transfers. Let this guy pay money to this guy so that it will be willing to establish the link. And we showed that with monetary transfers, the price of anarchy drops from an unbounded value to such a small value even uh, in the non-symmetrical case. Okay, so this was a very brief snapshot on the static results. Now, the dynamic results. Well, first, we established some uh, properties there regarding the rate of convergence, and essentially, we showed that if the network stabilizes, that is, no more nodes appear or disappear, then the convergence to the equilibrium would be pretty fast. 
However, the more important finding has to do with what is called network motifs. These are sub, uh, subgraphs with a certain particular structure that our analysis predicts that would, keep, that would keep appearing and disappearing and then appearing again in the evolving topology. Okay? And uh, these subgraphs are all, always in the terms of how the minor destinations attach themselves to the major destinations. One such motif we, uh, uh, was this one, which we termed as a double star. Essentially, you have here a star of nodes around this hub, and another star around this uh, hub that is one of the neighbors uh, in the uh, first star. Another motif is this one, which we call the entangled cycle. Uh, interestingly, in a previous study that considered real data about the evolution of the internet uh, topology, the authors noted that they keep seeing this motif appearing, and they stated that they couldn't explain the reason why, whereas our model explains why this should be the case. Okay, so here is where data analysis ca comes in. We took these motifs, and we then considered data about the past evolution of the internet interest topology, and we counted how many times we see structures like this. And we saw that that's a lot, a lot of times. But how can we be sure that this is really a lot? What is a lot? One million, 10 million, 100 million times? So to get some, some insight into that, uh, we did the following. We took a standard network generator, standard in the sense that it is built on the common models for a, a, a modeling the a, a structure of the internet topology. That is, models that do not incorporate our assumptions regarding a game or regarding reliability. And we produced, we synthesized topologies. And then we counted how many times we, we, uh, 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 we see, we encounter the motifs in the, in the synthesized topologies. And it turned out that there is a huge gap between their appearance in the real data, as predicted by our model, and the number of times that they were generated by the random topologies. Another finding uh, related to the data analysis. Our analysis also predicts that over time, as more and more nodes or autonomous systems uh, appear uh, in the internet topology, the average distance between nodes would shrink. That is, a bigger internet will shrink in terms of diameter. This is as opposed to many, if not all, standard models for uh, modeling the, uh, uh, the internet topology that say that with more nodes, not with more links, but with more nodes, the diameter would grow. True, they say that this will be a, a, a weak dependence, like the log of n or even the log of the log of n, but anyway, it would be monotonously increasing in the number of nodes. Our model predict, uh, analysis predicted the opposite, and the data analysis confirmed that. That this is what happened in practice. To sum up some of the main findings. So uh, our static analysis uh, also established some other interesting uh, uh, properties. For example, in all equilibria, the major players always form a clique which is settlement free. Settlement free means that there is no need for monetary transfers. Whereas, and due to the reasons that I outlined, many of the major uh, uh, player to minor player uh, uh, um, interactions uh, uh, do need to employ a, a monetary transfers or what, or what more precisely what is known as a trans, transit uh, contract transactions. As is well known, both of these properties are well supported in, uh, uh, in, uh, empirically. Uh, price of reliability, we talked uh, uh, enough, and here is a more precise way to state what I just said about the shrinking diameter. Precisely what we established is that as the number of major players increases, the distance of the minor players to the core of established by the major players should decrease, and this was confirmed empirically. Uh, we also saw a, a predicted the repetitive appearance of some network motifs, and as I said, there is a big gap uh, between their appearance in the real data, as predicted by us, and what a standard model uh, uh, generated. And actually, this gap is uh, uh, statistically significant. It, uh, it is uh, larger than uh, 10 standard deviations. So, so, 
to wrap up, we constructed a model that is built on heterogeneity of the players, reliability considerations, and possible monetary transfers. We built on that a network a formation game on which we conducted both a static and a dynamic analysis, and for which we conducted a, a study on the price of reliability, the topological properties of uh, the equilibrium, the rate of convergence to equilibrium, the recurrence of network motives, and all these were compared with data analysis, and there we, uh, we got quite a, a encouraging a, a, a insight. So this was the first part of the talk, right on time. Uh, I wonder whether we'll take questions now Maybe or, we can pause or uh, you want to I can finish. go back to this later. Okay. Okay, let's move on to the second part. Okay, so as I promised, these two have to do with game theory, but from a completely different uh, angle. And this uh, piece of work formed part of the PhD thesis of another alumnus of mine, a Gidon Block. Now, most of the work on the application of game theory to communication networks, including, for example, the work that I just described on the network formation games, dealt with non-cooperative games. What is a non-cooperative game? Well, first of all, it is a game. That is a situation in which you have players that are rational and selfish, each attempts, attempting to mas maximize its own utility. In a non-cooperative game, the players cannot communicate, or maybe they can, but in any way they cannot reach a binding agreement, an agreement that, uh, uh, on how they would play the game, and one that can be later enforced. This is maybe the most natural way to think or to contemplate a game in an engineered system. You have controllers or protocols or, or algorithms, each senses the state of the network from time to time and reacts in a self-optimizing step, what is known in game theory as a best reply action. And such a sequence of best replies would converge, if it does, would converge to some equilibrium, usually to a Nash equilibrium. What is a Nash equilibrium? It is a set of actions or strategy choices, one per player, where no player can unilaterally improve its performance by changing its strategy. So the Nash equilibrium is the main solution concept in a non-cooperative game. And accordingly, the main figure of merit that has been proposed to see how well or how bad the system is doing due to the presence of a game is as I said before, the price of anarchy, which is defined as the, uh, the ratio between the worst system performance at any Nash equilibrium and the optimal system performance. And the price of anarchy can sometimes be huge, even unbounded. Now, it is important to note that the price of anarchy quantifies not only the price that we pay due to the selfishness of the users, but also due to the inability to cooperate. However, in more and more networking scenarios, the players, the decision makers, do have an opportunity or the, at least the, the, the potential possibility to communicate and to uh, reach binding agreements, in which case the right framework to deal with these situations is provided by cooperative game theory. And the cooperative game, just as any game, is one in which the decision makers are self-optimizing a, a, rational uh, entities. However, now we assume that the players can communicate and try to reach a binding agreement. The solution concept of a cooperative game is not as an equilibrium anymore, and various solution concepts have been proposed for cooperative games, to name a few, the Nash bargaining solution, the core, and the nucleolus. Uh, well, some of, the, uh, some, some of the fonts disappeared. Well, here, you should have it, uh, envision a table and, uh, with rows and columns. And this table describes the uh, space of problems that we considered in our study. 
It, uh, uh, so the uh, columns uh, stand for the solution concepts that we considered. I already, me already mentioned the Nash bargaining solution, the core and the nucleolus. And we also considered in some, uh, uh, in part of the study, the concept of the strong Nash equilibrium, which corresponds to situations kind of in the borderline between a cooperative and a non-cooperative game. The uh, rows describe the type of players that we considered. We focused, as is usually done, on the classical case of, of uh, selfish or, or fully rational players, that is, each tries to self-optimize itself. However, we occasionally also consider the presence of malicious players. These are guys that do not care about improving their performance, they just want to make harm to everybody. Why? Well, because maybe they are, that's the, their nature, maybe they are hackers, or maybe there's a fierce competition between, among companies and one company wants to drive the other ones out of the market no matter what, or because some of the players are not smart enough and they do dumb things that may hurt themselves, but in terms of whoever is playing with them, uh, uh, they, are cons uh, they should be considered to be malicious because they can uh, uh, do very nasty things. So you see here which combinations we did consider and all the empty cells uh, are open for future research. In the uh, not much time that I still have, I will focus on uh, this piece of work. And in the very last minutes, I, sh I shall say a couple of words about this one. In this work, uh, we considered an important uh, concept, uh, important question. Is it worthwhile to cooperate? Because even if we can establish some ways, uh, some way for the players, the users in the network to communicate, and even if we can establish some mechanism that would enforce any agreement that they reach, these things would typically incur, incur some overhead and some price. And the question is whether it is worthwhile from a system-wide perspective. That is, we would like to know how much better, if at all, the system would be doing under the solution of the cooperative game as opposed to the non-cooperative uh, counterpart. So we chose the Nash bargaining solution as the solution concept to address this question. And the Nash bargaining solution is informally a unique agreement scheme that should fulfill certain conditions or axioms. Individual rationality says that under the agreement, no play, oh, that nobody will sign the agreement unless it would get something better than without signing the agreement. Pareto efficiency means that under the agreement, you cannot have a situation in which one of the players says, guys, look, let's do something else. I will benefit from it, and none of you will lose anything. If such, such a situation occurs, it means that the solution is a bad solution because it lacks Pareto efficiency. Symmetry means that if two players look the same, then under the agreement, they should get the same. Invariance to equivalent payoff uh, says that it doesn't matter whether we are talking about uh, euros or your US dollars or Israeli shekels, the solution would be the same. You just have to translate from one notion to the other. Independence of rele irrelevant alternatives means that if there are some possible ways to play the game, but these ways did not affect your solution, then the solution would be unchanged even if you erase these possibilities a priori. Okay. An important concept in any bargaining uh, scheme is that of the disagreement point. That is, any bargaining scheme considers two possible situations. Either all of us sign the agreement, or we all move to some well-known operating point. And this is particularly important to, to deal with or to formulate this axiom of individual rationality. To know whether I, should, I, I am doing better or not we, under the agreement, I should know what would happen if I do not sign the agreement. We chose as our disagreement point the Nash equilibrium. That is, we said the following. Either everybody signs the agreement or we go and play the non-cooperative game and get what we get at the Nash equilibrium. Okay, so now we have a new solution concept. So we need also a new figure of merit, not the price of anarchy. And that figure of merit that we introduced, we termed it as the price of selfishness. Why price of selfishness? Because it is the price that you pay uh, solely due to the selfish nature of 
the uh, decision makers, whereas the price of anarchy is a price that you uh, pay also for their inability to cooperate. And the price of selfishness is defined as, similarly to the price of anarchy, as the ratio between the worst uh, system performance at any bargaining solution and the optimal system performance. So it is almost like the price of anarchy. You have the social optimum at the, in the denominator. You have Nash at the denominator. But in the price of anarchy, it's the Nash equilibrium. And na now it is the Nash uh, bargaining solution. By the way that we defined everything, we can take it for, for granted that the price of selfishness cannot be more than the price of anarchy. Why is that? Well, we said that our disagreement point is the Nash uh, equilibrium. And by the axiom of individual rationality, nobody will sign the agreement unless it gets at least as much, or unless it will pay no more than what it would pay at the disagreement point. So you can be sure that this cannot be more than this. But now the big question is whether you can uh, make sure that this uh, inequality is strict, that you will gain, uh, gain something by moving to the cooperative scenario, and if so, how much? Okay, so that's the big question. How much smaller would that be uh, compared to the uh, price of anarchy, if at all? To answer that, we considered as our framework that of a basic and widely studied network routing game, which can be thought of also as a generic load balance, uh, balancing game. So in this game, we have a set of players or users. Each has a certain demand in terms of packets per second or jobs per second that need to be served. The aggregate demand of everybody shall be denoted as capital R. Capital R. And these uh, demands should be served either by links, or you can think about them as servers. And each uh, player uh, decides how to split its demand among the various links or servers. So that's the strategy of each player, to define its flow over each link. What matters to the link is the aggregate flow. That's the congestion level of the link. That is the sum of the flows of all the players. Each player pays something over each link. There is a function that is the cost function of the player on the link. And in general, it depends on two things. First, on how much it in the player invested in the link. For example, if it invested nothing, usually it would pay nothing. And second, on the a, a load on the link. A higher load would incur a, a larger cost. What matters to the player, the thing that he tries to minimize, is the aggregate cost over all the links. What matters to the system is the aggregate cost, that is the sum of the costs of all the players. In, it has been proven in a previous work that in the non-cooperative scenario, this system admits a unique Nash equilibrium point. And that's very good news. Because before I did a, a little bit of cheating, I said that we chose a, as our disagreement point the Nash equilibrium. But a Nash equilibrium is not guaranteed to exist. And when it does, there may, might be multiple Nash equilibria, whereas a disagreement point must be exactly one. So the good news is that, at least in our case, we know that we have a unique Nash equilibrium. OK, we further focused on a class of players that we called homogeneous. These are players that care all about the same thing. For example, they all try to minimize delay. Each tries to minimize their, its own delay. They are selfish, but they all care about the same thing. In this case, the cost function of a player on a link can be represented as the product of two things, how much flow it sends on the link times something that captures the performance of the link, and that something is independent of the type or of the identity of the player because they all care about the same thing. For example, if they care about delay, that would be the uh, delay per unit of flow. And it depends on the congestion level or, uh, of the link. The general case is that of heterogeneous players where each can care about something else. I care about delay. You care about packet loss, etc. In that case, we cannot say about the cost function anything beyond what we already said. 
Okay, furthermore, we said that in a, for homogeneous a, costs, a very typical situation, a situation is one in which the performance of, of the link depends on one thing, namely on the saturation level. That is, each link is associated with a capacity, and the performance depends on the residual capacity. As the flow uh, approaches the capacity, uh, this uh, uh, cost would grow to infinity. Okay, so for example, a simple example is the case in which all care about delay, and delay is captured through the well-known MM1 QE formula. I'm jumping to the results. Result number one, we showed that for homogeneous players, you can be sure that the price of selfishness would be strictly less than the price of anarchy. You will get, uh, you will get something. It sounds simple, but believe me, it was really painful to get that proof. How much? Well, in some cases, you can ga gain a lot. In all these cases, the price of anarchy can be made arbitrarily large, yet, in some cases, the price of selfishness can be guaranteed to attain its minimal value of one. That is, while, the, while without a gain, the, so, sorry, without cooperation, the performance can be very, very bad, with cooperation, you can achieve a solution that is socially optimal. One such case is the case in which you have precisely two players, and then the other one is the case in which uh, you have any number of players but of equal size, that is, the same traffic demand. As I said, it was pretty painful to obtain these results. I cannot even delineate the uh, idea of the proof. I'll just say one thing. At the core of the proof, there was one property which is not trivial to show, but it does exi uh, exist, uh, it does hold for homogeneous players. And the property is that at any stage of the game, all the players perceive the links in the same way. That is, they all think that this link is better than this link, etc. And actually, uh, a link with a higher capacity will always be perceived as a better link uh, by all the players. This quite simple property does not hold, of course, for heterogeneous players. Because if I care about delay and you care about packet loss, then I might like best this link which has excellent delay, but it might have poor performance in terms of packet loss. So because we didn't have this property, we knew that we have no hope to extend our proof to the non-homogeneous, to the heterogeneous case. And after much uh, work, we understood why, because we got a counterexample. That is, there are cases, quite extreme cases, but there are, well, there are cases that we have found in which, with heterogeneous players, the price of selfishness is as bad as the price of anarchy, and both of them can be arbitrarily bad. One might say that this is not surprising. Why? Because if I care about one thing, and you care about the other thing, and the system cost sums up these two things, then what are we doing now? We are kind of adding apples and oranges. So why should we expect to get anything sensible out of that? However, when we investigated, when we gave a closer look at those counterexamples, the examples that showed that the price of selfishness can be as bad as the price of anarchy, and both can be very bad, it turned out that something deeper happened then. The situation there was that there was at least one player, here we called it number two, it doesn't matter, for which the thing that he cares about cannot really be supported by, sustained by the system. For example, he cares about delay, and in this system of parallel links, no matter how you arrange the traffic, there would be at least someone that would suffer badly from delay. So what we thought is to say the following under such situations. Let's take this guy that is complaining and is causing both the price of selfishness and the price of anarchy behave very bad. Let's pick him and say, you know what? You are the boss. Optimize all the traffic according to what you perceive to be important. Delay? OK, optimize delay. But you should optimize everything, not only your, uh, uh, your flow, your traffic. Let's see how well you are doing if at all. So the question is, how much might the performance of a user deteriorate due to the selfish behavior of the other users with respect to the case where all the traffic would be optimally controlled according to its own cost function? In this gives rise to yet another price concept that we introduced, namely the price of heterogeneity, which for a user I is defined as the cost experience by that user at the non-cooperative gain over the social cost it would experience according to its own perception. 
So this can be thought of as the price of anarchy as seen by that user. Quite surprisingly, we have been able to show that under the very general setting of heterogeneous cost functions, the price of heterogeneity can never be more than the reciprocal of your relative share in the system. For example, if you control half of the flow in the system, the price of heterogeneity would, uh, would not be more than two. To sum up this piece of work, for homogeneous players, good news. By moving to a cooperative game, things that behave possibly very bad in the non-cooperative uh, game can be much better, even socially optimal, in the cooperative scenario. For heterogeneous players, bargaining might not help, since there both the price of selfishness and the price of anarchy may be unbounded. And the piece of advice that we can provide to a player in a heterogeneous setting is you should better be big. If you are big, then your price of heterogeneity would be small. Sorry? That was from the other room. OK, I have three minutes. So I'll say a few words about this piece of study. The Nash, the Nash bargaining solution is cute, but as any bargaining solution, it contemplates a situation in which there are two extreme possibilities. Either we all sign the agreement or we all go to a disagreement point. Sometimes this is the, the situation, but sometimes this is not. What if some of us say, let's forget about the other guys, let's sign our agreement. We don't need them. We shall be doing better without them. And so the question is whether the Nash bargaining solution is stable against such sub-coalitions. And the answer is that, in general, it is not. So if we do care about stability because we want to protect our system from such collusions, then we are looking for solutions that are in what is known in game theory as the core of the game, solutions that are stable against sub-coalitions. So in this other piece of work, we wanted to investigate such solutions, solutions that are in the core. And one important question is, OK, suppose that we form our sub-coalition. What can we expect that would happen? Well, there is no clear answer to that. But we contemplated two uh, uh, scenarios. The first is to say, well, it's just the continuation of the previous uh, story uh, of the uh, basic disagreement point. We shall play a non-cooperative game with all the rest. However, now each of the others will continue being one player. And we, as a coalition, shall play together as one player that in which we shall all coordinate our actions. This game will get us to some Nash equilibrium point, and we should see whether this is better from whatever we would have been able to obtain without forming our sub-coalition. The other uh, scenario is kind of a worst case uh, design, in which you say, well, I have no idea what will happen if we collude. Maybe some of the other guys will be very upset and will try to harm us. Maybe the situation is that I don't have any idea about the disagreement point because I know nothing about the rest. So I'd better take the, a worst case approach. And hence, whatever we do, we should expect the worst response from the others. So this is kind of a zero sum game in which we play as one player, and the rest are the adversary. OK, jumping to the results in my last minute. So in all this, uh, 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 in the framework of this study on the sub-coalitions, et cetera, we concentrated on the case of homogeneous players, those that care all about the same thing. Actually, this is usually what is done in many, if not most, studies on applying games to networks. Uh, the diversion to, uh, to uh, uh, investigate uh, heterogeneous players was quite the, um, the exception. And here we considered both uh, the two types of players that I mentioned before. Well, I didn't mention them before. Let's get back to this table. I said that the rows illustrate the type of players that we contemplated. And I said one thing, that we contemplated selfish players and malicious players. But there is another distinction that we made between bottleneck players and additive players. 
additive players are players that care about something that adds up along your connection. For example, delay. Your delay from end to end is the sum of the delays along the path. Bottleneck players are players that are affected by the weakest component in the connection. For example, in a wireless setting, if you care about lifetime, the battery life of uh, the component with the weakest battery, and so on. Okay, so now we can talk about bottleneck players. So in the context of investigating sub-coalitions, we considered first players with bottleneck objectives. These are kind of the more the simpler objectives to analyze. So here we consider general topologies, not just parallel links, any number of nodes, any interconnecting topology. And we got the following result for both cases, the case in which you contemplate a situation in which we uh, form our coalition and then play a non-cooperative game, and the worst case scenario in which everybody is against us. And in both cases, it turned out that if you take any solution that is socially optimal, and propose it as a solution for the players, that solution would be in the core. That, it, that is, it would be stable against the formation of sub-coalitions in either of these two cases. Then for additive routing games, as I said, this is the more complex structure of the cost function. Here we ha had to limit ourselves to the basic topology of two nodes and parallel links and to the maximum scenario, the worst case scenario. And for that setting, we got the same result. That is, take any socially optimal solution, propose it as a solution for all the players. That solution would be stable against uh, deviations of sub-coalitions. So to sum up, I started with the question of, of whether it is worthwhile to bargain. The answer is like in real life, it depends on what you are bargaining for. Now more seriously, in these pieces of work, we also provided some design guidelines that uh, are uh, hinted by our analysis. I don't have time to get into that. They are, uh, I believe, well documented in the two papers that I overviewed. One of them has uh, been published in the IEEE ACM Transactions on Networking, the one on the Nash bargaining solution. The other one on the sub-coalitions and the core, etc., is about to appear in the IEEE Transactions on Network Science and Engineering. Thank you. Now there's time for questions. Okay, yeah. Please. The first is, what kind of uh, tools do you use to prove that the, the first game has an Nash equilibrium? And are there any standard techniques you use to prove your results, or they're just... Uh, well, there are standard techniques, but uh, it's not that there is nothing that is very, really specific. It's just, you know, you take the, the, the mathematical formulation and, uh, and, and dig into that. Okay. And the second question is regarding, at some point, uh, you, when you were talking about comparing with uh, some internet models, it said that you use the configuration model. And as far as I know, the configuration model has, for instance, a vanishing clustering coefficient in the limit. Uh, like it's been shown that internet topologies have some properties such as the, the degree distribution follows a power law or the clustering coefficient doesn't vanish where the link goes to infinity. Do you have any idea of how the of how this game theoretic model uh, deals with those properties? Okay, some idea I do have, uh, not about everything that I because some things have been tested against, as you said, the a configuration model, but for example, uh, the property regarding the, sh uh, the shrinking uh, diameter uh, in, in, in a power law topology, you will not get that. If you add nodes, then the diameter would increase slowly. Okay? okay. Well, uh, of course, it depends there too on how you tune the parameters, but for the plausible set of parameters. Okay? So, in general, uh, I would say that these findings that I highlighted, they give some uh, hints 
It's not that they prove that the internet behaves precisely like that. For sure, the answer is no. But they hint that in the evolution of the topology, there is something that has to do with maybe economic powers that give rise to a game, and also, equally important, the reliability considerations that are usually neglected in typical models about the internet topology. And so, regarding, but do you know any specific topological rough results about the model? No. For instance, do you know if the model, when you, you make, make it grow, follows certain like, graph properties? So just, do you know anything about the degree distribution of that graph? No. Uh, we, well, to a certain extent, yes. For example, the, this thing about the, uh, the shrinking diameter distance in the, in the, sen the more precise sense that I said at the end of the talk. Uh, yeah, it's also on the first part. You distinguish major ASs and minor ASs, but among your major ASs, I saw Google, Netflix, Akamai, these are content providers. And yeah. The doesn't distinguish the notion of content provider and ISP, which is, seems to be very structured. The, uh, the icons there should not be taken too seriously. Just have to give you the hint that they are major players in the internet and minor players. Yeah. Uh, in a sense, we are talking about entities that have their networks that need to interact with other networks, and essentially it's an AS to AS scenario. And these entities come sometimes in big size and uh, with a big budget, and sometimes uh, uh, I that's... I think it was necessary then to distinguish this. I like the fact that you wouldn't connect to Akamai via Google. The, uh, the, answer is, uh, the answer is that it is necessary. As I yeah. said, this I, I, we yeah. think that heterogeneity is important. Yeah. As I said, we took a first cut in this study and said there are two sets. Surely there are many more sets. And actually, in part of the, our study, and this is documented in, in the paper, we also saw that some, uh, along the evolution, sometimes minor players start to play the role of a, ma a major player. OK. I have a very basic question. I, uh, in the first talk, in the first part of your talk, you mentioned that the uh, two nodes, A and J, will decide to have a link if a, uh, it is valuable for both of them. Yes. So this is like you are using the peering approach, and yes. you don't have transport links, right? right? Between, a, between I, I don't know, a tier 3 and a tier 2, or a tier 2 and a tier 1. So again, to get into this level of details, you need more than the first cut of major and minor. Where essentially, we said, in this game, each side needs to pay something, and nobody will pay it unless it is beneficial for it. So the answer is no. We didn't consider anything beyond that. Can you consider that the possibility of one to pay the other to yes. establish the link? You consider in some way this case, right? Because if I compensate you, it's like uh, I'm the only one paying for this link. Uh, Okay, you can say that, uh, yes, but it, it is not a one-to-one -one correspondence between the, but, but you are right that the monetary transfers capture part of this story, yes. That's the transit contracts. So as I said, our, mod our analysis does predict that the uh, interactions between the, what we call the minor players to the major players would involve such contracts and as we all know, this is what happens in practice. Okay. Uh, can I, can I, I was thinking of, in, in the second part of the talk. The second. Okay. Uh, so, no, don't bother. I don't think it's necessary. Okay. My question was about the, the, the routing games which you studied over many years. And practice, I mean, practice and routing in, in the internet is still very non-game, non-gaming, it's, it's, it's very deterministic based on, on routing protocols, BGP, which are very strange, but they're not routing games. So what, what, what would be the, 
application context? I think, yes. It, it is, I called it the routing game for, because it is, an, in, in using networking terminology, it is routing. But as I said, this is, a, while it is a very basic case of routing, it is a generic case of load balancing. You have jobs, and they need to be served by one uh, out of uh, several uh, servers. Okay, okay, I think it's time to close Ayan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.